All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, colleagues. Depending on where you're joining us from, it is the end of the main morning coffee break here at HMPW in person. So we might have some people joining us as we get started, but let's dive right in. Uh, also, there are colleagues joining online, and we're recording this session, so that will be made available in case you're trying to juggle too many events at once here in Geneva or virtually at HMPW. My name is Stuart Campo, and I'm the team lead for data responsibility at the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs Center for Humanitarian Data. And we're really excited as one of the co-chairs of the data responsibility working group to be co-organizing this event with the global cash advisory group, which I will now refer to as the CAG because it's much less of a mouthful for the rest of this session. So I'm joined today by a group of experts who are going to look at different challenges and opportunities to data responsibility in cash. We've got a good amount of time for this discussion. So we're going to go through a few rounds of sort of structured interventions and then we'll open up for Q&A. People in the room, obviously, just feel free to raise your hand when we get to that portion of the session and people joining online. You can simply drop your questions into the chat. So with me here on the panel is Juliet Lang, who is the global lead for cash coordination at OCHA and also the co-chair of the Global CAG. Rami Bigdar, who is a cash technical advisor at Catholic Relief Services, CRS, and the CCD representative for the Global CAG. Louisa Seferis, an independent expert on cash and the co-founder of ZEBS. And Ian O'Donnell, the Global Cash Lead for the International Federation of the Red Cross. Thank you all so much for joining us today. To start the discussion, even though it seems sort of obvious now, particularly in the domain of cash, that digital tools and data are central to how we design and deliver assistance to people affected by crisis, we wanted to give a couple grounding interventions on where the dialogue has evolved to and how the sort of space of digital and data in cash looks. So to start, Juliet, you know, given the, the longstanding role you've played in cash coordination and the more strategic side of cash, could you share a bit how you've seen the discussion on the promise of digitalization and more data-driven programs uh, evolve over the past several years? Thanks so much, Stuart. Um, I think it's been quite interesting to watch this conversation evolve over the last few years, and we've seen certainly some different narratives, I think, which originated with some a lot of excitement around the idea of efficiencies, right? Cash will bring more efficiencies. If we do things more digitally, it'll bring more efficiencies. And I also think we need to be a little bit frank and honest with ourselves about why digitalization became so important correlated with the discussion of cash. And that was because of the fact that the fungibility of cash raised questions around what are we giving it for? Is it duplicative? What is it overlapping with? Oh my gosh, can we make sure that we are making sure that the people who need it are receiving it and we're not giving it twice? And I think that that initial excitement, this idea of let's bring everything together, let's try and bring everything into the one system. There was a lot of narrative around this idea of, oh, I'm being told I am not loud enough, which is a rare critique of myself. Thank you. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, great. I will lunge a little bit closer to the mic, but please do keep us uh, keep us updated. So, uh, and I'll also look at my notes. Uh, so, I think that those initial discussions very much focused on this idea of creating digital systems that be could become everything. This all singing, all dancing. Oh my gosh, we could do more cash. Oh my gosh, it could be more efficient. And why don't we have one system, one card, one registry, one thing behind everything that pulls everything together? And I think it's been very interesting to watch the evolution of this initial kind of very, you know, kind of excitable, but also very kind of um, kind of single minded approach in terms of the initial discussion evolve. And I think that now the discussion around cash is much more around how we need to kind of consider the opportunities, for example, around like the opportunities around digitalization, around preparedness, around social protection, which we'll discuss about a bit more. But also that I think that these conversations in the last few years particularly have forced us to think about less of this idea of single approaches or one thing that can do everything, but more about how we structure our system better, how we can collect information better, how we should be doing or being effective in a better way. So I think it's really interesting that cash has kind of um, uh, piqued this interest, that it spurred this conversation. But where the conversation is now beginning to move is much more about the differences it could make, not just for us in cash programming, but wider within the system. Thanks. <laughs> 
Thanks so much, Julia. And we'll come back to that sort of trend of cash being the tip of the spear in a lot of ways in the sector for the use of digital tools and more advanced data techniques. But first, I want to sort of stay in this space of the promise of digitalization and cash. So, Louisa, could you share some of the expected benefits based on the different uh, organizations you've engaged with around digitalization and cash and sort of concretely what we hope to see from the use of these tools? Well, I mean, Juliet, you really hit it on the head in terms of the, the promise of efficiency. And I think we all got excited about being able to streamline and to standardize the way in which we were engaging with people and providing assistance. And this idea that digitizing cash was going to be a win-win, right? So people were, were looking to get cash quickly. Um, and for organizations, there was this idea of more of an instant reconciliation. And I remember working in the early days a lot with logistics colleagues and how much they really turned to digital cash as a kind of new way to, to be able to instantly be um, accountable, to be able to manage risks and all that. I do think also one of the other things, for better or for worse, I know we're going to get into this, but is around having more information and being able to program better and to respond to needs in real time. This idea that digitizing the whole program cycle of cash um, in different ways, whether or not it's one system, was going to give us real time information, the ability to interact with people, um, you know, two way communication, all these kind of promises that we've seen um, develop in different ways. Thanks, and I realize it's hard to resist the urge to dive into the sort of paired perils, but we'll get to that uh, momentarily. Rami, from a perspective of coordinating cash working groups and providing technical advisory support on cash in different contexts, what are some of the additional benefits that come to mind for you? Um, uh, thanks, Stuart. Um, well, in addition to what um, my colleagues have just mentioned, I'd like to highlight, um, you know, enhanced security when we use digital systems to deliver cash. Um, there's, of course, you know, the apparent increased transparency um, and accountability when you have these systems um, digitized and, um, you know, performing these checks and validations with all of the data that comes in. Um, one more important thing, and I think it's perhaps something we don't discuss as much, um, is what is the benefit to the recipients themselves of digitizing um, this, um, uh, this, this entire program cycle? And one of it is basically increased flexibility. So if I was to zero down on transfer values, for example, um, we can use a lot of digital tools and a digital means to um, uh, deliver the cash assistance. Um, once we have these, these digital tools come with a lot of flexibility um, um, and enable us to respond to the market. So we're just trying to mirror um, the, uh, the market, uh, the needs as measured in the market. Over. Thanks, and I think it's, of course, important to keep in mind whose benefits we're talking about, as well as shortly whose risks, because it's really the perspective that will allow us to balance when making decisions about how, well, if so, maybe the question shouldn't be how, but if so, and how to deploy new tools in our cash programs. Ian, a slightly different version of the same question, how has the IFRC invested in these tools and what are some of the programmatic goals or kind of outcome level objectives that have driven that investment in recent years? Sure, thanks, Stuart. Uh, for the IFRC side, I think we're, yeah, we're really interested in the opportunities to integrate cash with other kinds of assistance and like using digital tools lets us connect you know, these kind of things more seamlessly. We're already using digital tools to do all kinds of community engagement and messaging. So being able to connect the cash assistance to you know the provision of in-kind assistance to referrals to information as aid we think this is like a really strong uh package on the service side i mean i do think for the recipient i want to just mention a couple points there too like it's a couple other things we've also seen is just like the speed of access you know we've done cash programs now in romania and moldova with a new self-registration tool you know that just spread across the country you know very quickly right so people in remote areas you can see them being able to to register and benefit from assistance you know within a week a week and a half um, and we also see interesting spikes of when people are registering actually right with a we really interesting spike in the evening right like around eight o'clock or nine o'clock which i think you know i don't have children but i understand that people that have kids this is the time when your kids have gone to sleep and you have a little bit of time and being able to to use that time to to interact with the system and register and do these things right at that time versus trying to do it in the middle of the day when you're juggling lots of other things. I mean, that convenience alone, I think, is also a, a huge win in many ways. Absolutely, and it raises another point, which maybe we'll come to a bit later in the discussion in terms of how we think about those types of preferences or habits or behaviors and how that should inform the design of these different tools in different contexts. 
it's not a one size fits all approach necessarily, but often there's been an increased push to invest in global tools that can be deployed in different contexts and adapted to the response. And so there is a balancing or kind of compromising of the features and functions that those tools can enable. So, <clears throat> Julia, coming back to you, just against the backdrop of these expected benefits and in many operations realized benefits of digitalization and cash. What has the sort of increased scrutiny look like from a perspective of risk? So thinking about some of the risks that, again, and for like the CAG or even in, when engaging with the IASC deputies and principals on this issue, what are some of the issues they're worried about or flagging for the cash community to address? Great, right, thanks. And yeah, I think that obviously with this increased excitement has come that increased scrutiny, right? I think that we recognize, particularly after that initial kind of flurry of discussion about the multiple discussions and multiple risks that we should be also considering. So at a global level, I think there's quite a lot of attention on the idea of data protection considerations and, and how that should factor in. And certainly even at the ISC deputies, this is again, and I'll talk about this more in a moment, not necessarily a cash specific issue, but it is one of the most prevalent things that we hear. We hear a lot more about with the increased use of cash and a corresponding increased use of digitalization, what are we doing in terms of data responsibility? Which brings me to kind of two interesting points for me anyway, um, which is one that I think that we hold cash programming in particular to a standard within the humanitarian system that we do not see that level of scrutiny in other mechanisms of humanitarian delivery. This can be frustrating at times. It can mean that we are slower uh, in, in certain kind of progressions or certain evolutions. But it also means that we have a chance to get it right. So I think the fact that we're asking questions about data protection, we're asking questions about consent, we're asking questions about the role of different types of partners in response and how we should be sharing information across different platforms as well. We're asking questions we probably should have frankly been asking quite some time ago. And cash seems to have been the kind of the, the, the tip of the spear or whatever you want to call it. It seems to have been a, a, a kind of a, a genesis for some of these discussions as well. So I think it's very interesting and we'll talk a little bit more and, and we have a little bit now of a, a stronger relationship with some of the more formal data considerations. But we did see at the global level that a lot of discussions within cash as we would start to speak about doing large scale cash programs very rapidly and immediately moved into questions about data responsibility, about data protection, about idea of consent, and particularly when we start to collect sensitive information, how it will be stored, who it will be shared with, etc. So I think, as I said, at a global level, we see an increased focus on it. And again, just to say from a cash perspective, it happens, but it is such a broader conversation that I think it is very heartening to see that move into a space, which also speaks to how systems work for programming writ large, not just within cash. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks, Julia. I mean, I think it's important to see this interest from humanitarian leaders and also the fact that these questions are being asked, as you say, in some ways, because of the comparative advantages and progress that the cash community has made on these issues, maybe compared to other parts of the system, you might be bearing the brunt of some of the scrutiny, but that can be a good thing as long as there are spaces to untangle those issues and then find solutions together. From a more operational perspective, Romney, thinking about some of the issues that Juliet flagged, what are the key risks, either from CRS's perspective of, or the broader network that you're a part of, that in any given operation you're mindful of addressing? Um, I just want to jump back a little bit and talk about, you know, the data that we collect about the recipients that we're trying to serve. And just to, to give a background before I answer your question, um, so we do household or community level assessments. Um, we undertake um, targeting and verification exercises. Um, we go back and do post distribution monitoring after the fact. Um, and then we also collect feedback and mechanisms. So this is all tied into like personal data of people um, and really going into the details of their lives, how, how they spend the money, what, when they go to the market, which markets they access. Um, and really, this is, I think it's an emerging um, global issue. Um, and the issue I'd like to highlight here is um, uh, issues of like the issue of surveillance and specifically surveillance capitalism. Now, Stuart, I know you're, you're asking yourself by now, what does that mean? Lucky for you, I have a defi definition over here. Um, so in this model, organizations collect vast amounts of data on people's behaviors, preferences, activities through online platforms, through different modalities that they receive this assistance. And it becomes, you know, 
an aggregation of all sorts of data across different organizations coming from different sources. Um, and the problem with this is that once this data is centralized and collected, um, it then poses a risk um, if it falls in the wrong uh, in the wrong hands, because as anybody um, that you know um, has thought about any you know uh, data database uh, management issues, we always ask ourselves when a breach may occur and not if it would. So in that sense, um, we need to th rethink about how much data we're gathering and um, how we're keeping it. Over. We'll come back to surveillance capitalism a bit later in the conversation, but of course it is <clears throat> an issue that's being discussed not only, <clears throat> excuse me, in the context of cash, but other aspects of humanitarian action. Some people are also already using the term surveillance humanitarianism, <clears throat> and this is not a new issue. Just to point out two, which we can share the links to in the chat after, but two studies that actually looked at this, including in the context of cash, dating back in the first instance to 2013. There's a piece of work from Privacy International that looks at aiding surveillance in different forms of humanitarian assistance and how these tools and the surface of surveillance have grown. That was 10 years ago, and we all know that there's been an inflection point in terms of the growth and use of these digital tools and the data that they generate. So we can only fairly assume that there is more potential for surveillance, you know, not whether, but when, and therefore we have to factor this into the design of our tools. It's also critical for us to be able to com communicate about the risks that affected people face directly to them when we're engaging them throughout the design and delivery of cash assistance. So Louisa, I know a lot of your recent work has involved engaging directly with people affected by crisis, including getting their perspectives on some of these tools and services that are being uh, introduced. Could you share a bit about some of their concerns in terms of the risks that they're mindful of, or perhaps asking about for different uh, operational settings? And to be clear, I'm not going to speak on behalf of affected people. I'm just going to talk a bit about the feedback that they've been giving, particularly across contexts. And it's interesting because we were just talking about this with IMAP in Colombia a couple of weeks ago on community engagement and, and digitalization. And I encourage you to look into that. And obviously, the examples, you know, it really overlaps with cash there. One of the first things that comes up, um, and I think it was very poignant in the Ukraine response, is that digital can exclude by design. Um, and people are very aware of that. And I think the, the big difference in the Ukraine response is that many people were able to share that directly via Facebook or WhatsApp, um, and there was absolutely no filter. So in a lot of ways, it was a really important response to reflect on because there was this promise of being able to reach a lot of people digitally, and it did come true. But there was also a perception from people receiving or trying to register that 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 system itself could could exclude people. Um, and so sometimes the the solutions are are analog um, in a lot of ways. We saw organizations stepping up, particularly a lot of local organizations coming in and providing um, complementary cash assistance that didn't require you know self registration via WhatsApp, whatever. So the second point is that digital uh, and and in order to have data responsibility, there needs to be people behind it. We still need humans, and there's a risk that if we get so excited about all the digital stuff and we forget to have people behind it. First of all, as you were saying, Stuart, you can't explain that, that you can't have informed consent. You can't have that kind of relationship where you can build trust and, and be responsible for the data. Um, but then it's also that, you know, likely the digital tools are, are going to fail and not be able to meet people's needs. The other thing that I think is really interesting, and this dates back, I would say, the last five years or so, as we really kind of tried to be more conscious about getting systematically, not, include, not only including people's feedback, but in using it to inform the design of programs, is that people really don't want to make, for humanitarians to make systems for them. They want them to make, how do, I don't know, I have to get this right. They don't want us to make special systems for them. They want us to enable systems to work for them. And why does that difference matter? Because essentially, one of the big promises is that digitalizing cash can connect people to, to new financial services or to systems that enable them over time to, to have better access to um, whether it's resources or cash, con combining it with other types of assistance, et cetera. That can't happen if we're continuing to treat people affected by crisis in silos and testing new digital tools, piloting new things um, that aren't connected to a broader system and not thinking about connecting people to those to those broader systems. And then the final point, which I think is something that we've been raising for a while and that people have been telling us consist consistently, but we need to really, especially in this new kind of digital era, is that 
opting out of providing data often means missing out on assistance. Um, and even if that's an option, it's not actually an option. And people, when we are exploring this, whether it's with um, you know, cash providers, um, so frontline teams, or with uh, people receiving cash themselves, they come out and say, well, you need information, you know, I need, I need that data, all those things that Rami was talking about, I need that data to program to provide assistance. And, you know, recipients come back and say, well, I have to provide my information, otherwise I don't get cash. And if there's a risk that I don't get cash because I didn't provide my information, why would I risk it? And so that means that data responsibility takes on a very different meaning with that type of power imbalance. Um, and as much as we want to talk about informed consent, we really need to, to keep that in, in, in perspective. Thanks so much for sharing some of those insights, Louise. And I want to come back to a few of those points later in the discussion, particularly <clears throat> to see if there are examples of different settings where the community has gotten that close to right or right, because there is some great work being done <clears throat> to address these concerns and to put people more at the center of cash programs. Thinking about sort of the benefits and risks or promise and peril of cash that we've just talked through, I want to think now a bit more about the concrete actions we can take to advance data responsibility. And Ian, I want to come first to you because IFRC has led by example in a number of different areas of that sort of data life cycle for cash in terms of how you've designed for data responsibility or done data protection by design in the development of different tools. So could you share a few examples of either current work or recent work that you and your partners are moving forward? Sure. Yeah, I think um, definitely the, the data protection element is something we've been trying to build out, you know, both in terms of how we promote digital literacy. Um, you know, we've referenced in a few other sessions the data playbook that the, uh, the IFRC has helped develop and sees as a resource, I think, for the wider humanitarian industry, but really trying to look at how do we provide resources um, both to our uh, colleagues within the Red Cross Red Crescent Network, but also colleagues in other organizations, but around how to build up more data and digital literacy, how to have that available, like for any anyone who's designing or managing programs. You know, I think we're also trying to backstop that with more support, you know, particularly on sort of the legal advising and the risk management advising um around data protection you know to see how can we make that kind of expertise more accessible um and available um yeah so i think it's, it's definitely a, a work in progress i mean i think the different kinds of collaborations we've been involved in you know this is a, a also how we test and try this out you know so you know uh, we've been talking a little bit in other sessions too around uh, the importance of data sharing agreements and doing those ahead of time you know putting the time and effort in um to have those um but yeah, so many stuff there. Thanks. That's great. And I think uh, just also for colleagues who maybe weren't able to join, there was a session earlier this morning looking in a bit more detail at some of the exciting new models for both uh, data sharing and data management, but also on the more technical side, the different tools that are available for supporting different aspects of data and cache. So I'm looking, but I think the recording will be available from that session and we can maybe even share them together. Um, I'm looking at Amos who organized that session, but it's good to join up <clears throat> these dots so that we know both in the kind of deeper dive on the technical aspects of the work and then the broader sort of process and system level interventions, how we can do this together. You also mentioned Ian, the kind of repeatable processes or tools and templates that a lot of organizations are using now. And it's important to keep in mind that there is a lot of good guidance out there now. The issue is not a lack of guidance, like most of humanitarian action. I think you see that also at this conference. There's a lot of guidance available, particularly at the global level, but also increasingly adapted to different operations. The trick is bridging that into practice and making sure <clears throat> that we're sort of standardizing things that make sense to carry from one place to the next, but also really adapting and supporting instinctive sort of adaptation of practice in different operations and also not treating that as a one-off process. I think that's been a, a key learning from cash, particularly in data responsibility, is that this is going to manifest differently in every environment. And so we have to keep our, our thinking agile. Rami, in a lot of your work, particularly on the cash coordination side, you, of course, have clear visibility on how partners talk about these issues and try to navigate them. Could you share a bit from that kind of cash coordination perspective in a country setting of what that looks like, what issues people want to work on together, and maybe where some of the sticking points are? Definitely. Thanks, Stuart. Excuse me. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about data minimization. Basically, if we're designing a, a cash intervention, a cash for food, for example, um, 
we always try to advise our partners um, to only ask the bare minimum questions that are essential for them to be able to make that decision on that delivery, specific delivery, right? Um, and Luisa um, makes a very pertinent point on consent, um, uh, on, on if we're asking for consent and then they expect something in return and then there's this power dynamic, um, then there's that issue of, you know, the onus is on us after the, having delivered that um, uh, assistance. Um, we need to actually get rid of parts of this data that is not no longer um, relevant for future uses. So we can keep the analysis. Um, we can truncate the personal data, personally identifying data about um, the individuals that have participated. Um, we can, I've seen actors basically tear up distribution lists after they're done with the distribution because they've had their evidence, they've uh, uh, delivered their assistance, and there's no need to keep this um, information on hand. So I think it's, it's always important to be aware of um, the data that we're collecting, um, and then the data that um, uh, at the end, after the analysis and after the delivery has, uh, has concluded, the data that we keep at the end, because a list of names after 10 years after the project has finished means nothing, um, but it is data that should not be kept there um, and, and should be um, perhaps you know, destroyed or deleted. Thank you. Thanks for that, Rami. It reminds me of one point of discussion that we in our support to different OJA offices have started to hear as an increasingly common issue, which is that kind of longer tail of risk that might outlive the true humanitarian phase of an operation. And we know, particularly from research done by the cash community, that people are often excluded from accessing financial services if it's known that they were once a recipient of a humanitarian cash program. And so the longer beyond humanitarian effects are also something we have to keep in mind. It's easy to think very sort of here and now because that's in many ways how we're wired as humanitarians, but the effects for people affected by crisis will often sort of outlive uh, the, the time of our given programs in different contexts. So we need to keep that in mind when we're doing the data impact assessment or risk and benefit assessment to inform a program and then make sure that we keep that fresh. I want to shift the discussion a little bit, and as I do that, just encourage people to drop questions into the chat if you're with us online or have questions ready, because uh, we will, after this round, move into the Q&A, and we've got plenty of time for that. So we're looking forward to this being interactive. But one of the things that has really accelerated or amplified the, the promise and the peril of digital tools and cash is the drive to integrate with social protection programs. This adds a lot of potential for scale and efficiency, but it also adds a lot of complexity, particularly around questions related to the safe, ethical, and effective management of data. So more from a strategic perspective, Juliet, what's driving that push to integrate with social protection programs in complex emergency settings? And what are the main reasons for this as sort of the emerging model of what good cash programming looks like? So I think in terms of why it is increasingly becoming um, uh, kind of a, a priority for us as well is, is that I think we've seen a couple of things. I think one is, is that we've seen large and complex humanitarian emergencies, which have in many cases existed for 20 years. Uh, they've gone on. DRC is a very good example of that, but there are many, many others. We see complex emergencies, they continue, and they continue in a kind of a humanitarian responses there exist in a very kind of reactive or responsive way, right? We're just going to react to this problem, but we're not looking at the wider piece around us. We've also seen increasingly, and obviously it's on all of our minds at the moment, uh, large scale conflicts or, or issues happening, which require humanitarian responses in contexts where we did not see humanitarian interventions before. And I think to pick up on your concept of like thinking about risks from a tail end beyond us, mm -hmm. I think that we as humanitarians also have had to reflect a little bit more on our role within a broader system. I think someone used the analogy once of playing chess on a chessboard and you're just playing with a game with one pawn. We don't often take account of the wider dynamics that are driving both humanitarian conflicts in protracted emergencies, but also we tend to, and this is true particularly of, of, of rapid emergencies, we tend to come in and presume, to Louise's point, that we need tailor-made models. We're going to come in, we're going to set something up, we need to react and respond immediately. And I think that more and more the conversation has moved to say, what can we build out? What is already there? Recognizing that not just in terms of the coverage, but also the financing and also the sustainability of those programs, that these are considerations we should be starting earlier. 
So I think, you know, when cash came on the scene as well, I think it, 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 it also allowed us to kind of bring those thinking, those pieces of thinking together to also say, particularly when we provide cash in a way that is more unrestricted and designed to meet a multiplicity of needs, it does start to look very much like social protection or social, you know, social uh, welfare systems that may be pre-existing. So I think that, again, if I, if I point to the kind of higher level discussions, I think what it kind of promoted initially was an, an initial excitement. Oh my goodness, this is what we can do. We can quite simply press a button, build out systems that are already existing, and when we t finish out, that we can kind of close them out really effectively by building into those pieces. The idea of shock response of social protection systems, which I think everybody is, is, is aware of here. I think that those have also generated wider complex issues, and this is to your question as well, in terms of what do we need to then kind of take account of and what they may need to be considered, particularly when it comes to data responsibility. I think it opens up questions about what role we play as humanitarians. Yes, we should build into systems where they exist. What happens though when, for example, humanitarian principles don't always align with systems as they may exist? What happens if we think needs require a higher transfer value, for example, in a practical um, example, than, 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 the, than the existing minimum wage? These kind of tensions are starting to kind of bubble up, and again, they're bubbling up through cash as well. And I think, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about the data responsibility risk, but obviously that, that is an enormous piece. Um, I think that we've seen huge promises of this, but I think we also need to be very aware of the fact that in many cases, populations that may become newly vulnerable, particularly in a time of crisis, may not necessarily be already in existing systems. What is our responsibility as humanitarians to enroll or register those people? And more importantly, what is our responsibility to, to hand over that information after we leave, if any? So I think that, you know, we do see best practices. I think it is a complex piece. Again, I know I sound like a broken record, but it is broader than just cash. And I am happy that we are opening this conversation in these forums. But I think that, you know, we have to realize the strategic implication of this in terms of the wider response. But I think at minimum, and it sounds very, very basic, but I think we realize that we rarely have the right people in the room. Uh, when we go into humanitarian emergencies, we coordinate in a cluster system, depending on the activation, whatever it is. Ministries are very rarely invited. Uh, languages are not always there. And I think we've started to see emerging models of where we've seen interpretations in meetings, where we've also seen a shift in terms of the humanitarian architecture to say, is it appropriate for us to hold this meeting at this time in this venue in this location, or should we actually be going to you know, existing coordination mechanisms, existing government ministries, and asking them how they speak to each other. Where would be an appropriate venue to have this discussion? And how can we best tap in? So I would say that they are nascent, but I would say that they are important conversations ongoing. My final point is, again, is, is that if we are to move this needle, and I, will, I, will, I'm, I am a coordinator, so I always point to coordination, but a lot of these conversations point just to conversations around coordination. We frame them under conversations around responsibility, around data, around cash. Some of these are also about how we as a system coordinate, not just with each other, but outside of it. Um, yeah, I will end there. That's great, Julia. And there are a few things now bubbling in my mind that we'll come back to in the Q&A, but I think it's a good backdrop from the strategic perspective of why there is this push and some of the enjeu, more from a, a sort of programmatic or coordination perspective. Let's look a little bit more specifically, Louisa, at the data responsibility considerations when we're looking at integrating with social protection systems or programs or both and sort of how those are manifesting and maybe even what some promising emergent practice looks like and how to get this right. Can I say the dirty word interoperability? <laughs> um, no, I think it's a really interesting question. And, and I think also the fact that cash assistance basically looks like social assistance, which is a subset of social protection. That means that the cash world, like you were saying, we're kind of held to a higher standard, but it kind of magnifies and exposes all the issues because fundamentally a social protection registry goes beyond cash and it should be linked to other humanitarian um, interventions. We don't always do that. So I just wanted to put that there. Um, I had the pleasure of joining um, a broader team as part of the basic research program, which is hosted by the um, Institute for Development Studies in the UK, and it's looking at basic assistance in crises across social protection and humanitarian programs. Um, now, I actually work on the social accountability side, but their colleagues, uh, Becky Faith and Tony Roberts, and I encourage you guys to, to look 
into what they've been doing on the digital space. And the reason I say that is because through them, they're working, they're looking at a lot of these digital risks from both a political and a technical perspective. Because one of the kind of elephant in the room is that we keep talking about, and that's why I say it's a dirty word, interoperability. We get really excited about getting these systems together and you know merging and who's selected and what data do we collect and all of that stuff. But a lot of the blockages and the issues that Julia are mentioning are, are political. And when I say political, the, I mean the broadest sense of the word in terms of the politics of, of humanitarian systems, the politics of engaging with development actors, and then, of course, the politics in country. And so one of the big questions when we're looking at, let's say, the accountability side of, of the data responsibility question on, uh, on social protection, it's about who is designing it and for whom, and I hope I use my who and my whom correctly, but the, the point is a, is a really important one because we're seeing a lot of proprietary systems um, on all sides. So whether it's development actors, humanitarian, government, etc., there's a lot of those hard questions that Juliet was raising that I don't think are, are easy to answer. Um, but uh, my colleague Rosa Akbari, who works a lot on these digital systems, she talks about digital entanglement, and I really like that term. But it's about saying, okay, well, we have a certain responsibility as, let's say, humanitarians working with communities to deliver assistance. Like you say, we may need to provide more assistance, shorter term, um, et cetera. But the government has a responsibility on a longer term, and we often overlook that. And when we start getting you know, excited or upset about the differences in approaches and maybe compromising humanitarian principles or standards, um, there are some really tough questions about who is accountable at the end of the day, and frankly, it's the government. So um, one of the last things I'll say on that is that it does become quite a big question also when there are liabilities in terms of this digital entanglement and how to walk back from systems that are being developed with governments um, in, you know, in different crises when suddenly, like we're seeing in Sudan right now, um, the government is no longer the same people that we've been working with. And the other thing that we've noticed in this work on kind of basic assistance in crises is that just the way we used to talk about the private sector as this big monolith, government is not homogenous. And so when we're doing this research and looking at kind of who's accountable and, and what kind of systems are we connecting to in terms of social protection, we often engage with national governments. And in places like Somalia, where we're working right now, um, you know, we've got all sorts of different networks and local government may feel very differently about it, even though they're the front line kind of responsible in terms of social protection. And the last thing I'll say is one of the biggest things I think is overlooked on, on this, because then we get into the politics and we talk about the compromises and the, and the humanitarian principles is that we forget to go back to communities and ask them who they're comfortable sharing information with and what information they share and applying that to then talk about data. Because sometimes we create risks or imagine risks that aren't there. And then sometimes we overlook really simple things that we think are, are pretty straightforward. And I think we have some really poignant examples in the Syria response. Um, so for example, in Turkey, everyone was talking about you know, digitalization. There's some risks there in terms of the data. And um, Syrian refugees were saying, hey, I have to share all my information to enter Turkey. It's already with the government. Please stop, you know, worrying about this. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing this anyway, right or wrong. I'm doing this. And then conversely, in Jordan, we found that um, even though there was, you know, this big push for the government integrated registry with the UN Common Cash, I forget what the name was at the time, UNCCS. Um, there were there was a smaller group of, of refugees who were very uncomfortable to share the information for political reasons, for protection reasons, and so there had to be a completely different response there um, when when it kind of was overlooked in terms of just being a given that this information could be shared securely and that it was a responsible thing to do. Thanks, Louisa. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, and I think increasingly this is the level of complexity in every operation where we're seeing a multitude of actors, a multitude of systems, a multitude of data management activities related to how we assess need, do targeting, actually deliver assistance, do deduplication, having interoperability throughout, ultimately to Rami's earlier point, retain or hopefully increasingly destroy data that is not required for you know the, the closure of programs and then look farther down to that integration with social cash programs around that kind of transfer of data if we have consent from the people whose data we're managing, and also how we think about the role of humanitarians to Juliet's point in terms of whether it's even a, a posture we should have in terms of advocating about differences in strategy and also the, the long-term effects of this work. 
the host government engagement piece is something that's become increasingly complex. And I know uh, that different organizations have, of course, different approaches to this. And IFRC managing some of the larger uh, humanitarian cash programs has some good experience to share. So could you share a bit, um, Ian, on the different ways that you've approached engagement with host government? Yes, related to the data piece, but also more broadly, if, uh, if you'd like to share that strategic piece. Sure. Yeah, I'm thinking through some of uh, Luisa's comments on these points in it. <laughs> I do think probably areas where we've been most successful are context. There is a, a fair degree of uh, this digital entanglement, right? I think that's actually a, maybe a, a sign of success in some cases, but it also depends a lot on the trust uh, with government and the ability to sort of manage objectives together. Um, I mean, it is interesting too, like this whole idea of the, the political side and the political risk. Yeah, I think these are things too that we we can't necessarily control, and I think we in these partnerships we are. Exposing ourselves to this kind of a uh, dialogue, Juliet, you talked about coordination outside the system. I mean, it's interesting when we get drawn into things that are outside the system, you know, and we have to sort of be able to uh, to negotiate, you know, those discussions. And you know, thinking a little bit around the uh, in in Turkey, the context um, before the earthquake, like at the towards the end of last year, you know, there were huge political issues happening in terms of the the electoral politics inside Turkey and the debates happening uh, with different parties. And I mean, the humanitarian assistance to Syrians was figuring prominently into that, right? And I think this question of like how do humanitarian organizations uh, navigate that space, you know, and part of it's like, I mean, both the, how we communicate and, and share information with media, um, but other parts are really around the community engagement side, right? And how we're talking about the, uh, how the programs work, how we're engaging both host communities, uh, people that are being assisted. Um, I do think, on the requesting side, I mean, there's some interesting things that we had, for example, in Turkey around the uh, last year, a study around the targeting criteria and you're trying to move away from something that was seen as a fairly complex uh, set of criteria for targeting and who received assistance and who didn't. And lots of questions coming from people like where their you know, neighbors receiving assistance and they're not and they, they want to know, like, what's the difference? Like, why did one one household or family qualify and not the other? And we. We were doing this interesting analysis to try and look at different targeting criteria for this ESSN uh, safe social safety net program in Turkey and like how could the targeting be improved, right? And it was sort of looking at both the uh, performance wise, how the targeting different targeting approaches worked and, you know, if we have means testing as a, as a gold standard, what other kinds of approaches could approximate the result. Um, but in the end, it was interesting to find, you know, we, we shifted to something that was much more of like a, a kind of a simpler dependency ratio calculation that actually performed very similarly in, in a lot of the population segments that we were trying to reach, um, but was easier to explain, you know, so it was easy. I mean, both easier for us to explain, easier for communities to explain to each other. <laughs> um, that is a big part of actually where the explanation happens, right? It's, uh, you know, we, we do one part of it, but then it's other people that are, you know, explaining to their neighbors, their, their family members. Um, but it's interesting to see where we could find solutions that actually have a similar performance result, but actually are easier to understand, easier to explain, uh, and probably easier to, to present and talk about in this sort of political uh, dialogue context, right? Uh, so, thanks. That, that clarity, both to, of course, uh, first and foremost, the people that we seek to serve, but also to national counterparts is essential. And it's something that, at least in my anecdotal experience, getting involved on the data responsibility side in cash often is overlooked, right? We see so many engagements with complaints and feedback mechanisms, which are purely due to confusion. And it's not an actual complaint other than that you're being unclear about the criteria where I can access assistance, why my neighbor got this and I am not entitled to it, et cetera. But much of that can be resolved with better communication, better community engagement, more clarity from the start. So I think there is a lot to be learned there. And this is not unique to cash, but as we started the conversation with, cash is often sort of the tip of the spear on these issues because it is one of the most sort of prominent in terms of scale, but also uh, engagement dependent in terms of the, at least the digital aspects of this work. I'm going to open the floor slowly to give people in the room uh, time to think of questions to, to the more open part of the session. I have a few additional questions in mind, but I'd really love to hear from people here in the room or online. We've covered a lot of ground in 45 minutes, but hopefully that gives you fodder for questions. You can either have a general question or if you want to ask one of the panelists specifically something, feel free. So the floor is open. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, 
My name is uh, Hussein Baharman, and I'm uh, an associate professor at the University of Agder, which is a university in Norway. We have a research project uh, uh, financed by the Research Council, um, and it's focused on um, digital delivery mechanisms for uh, cash-based assistance for refugees. Um, but one of the so I have a question. I have two questions, but the first question to the whole panel is. Um, when we talk about digital um, data, uh, digital mechanisms, what kind of mechanisms are we talking about? There is no consensus here. So we hear a lot of things from different organizations, from different actors, from donors, different things, from NGOs, different things. So what is it that we call digital delivery mechanism or digital cash-based assistance. This is the first. Um, the second question is to um, I4C. <laughs> um, we reviewed many re several reports from your program. Um, we still cannot figure out when you talk about performance results, what you are talking about. Because it is not clear for us what is performance and what are the metrics that you have used in, in, uh, for evaluation and for your programs. Uh, we also talked to um, focal points in Norway, and we are still in contact, but we are still figuring out. Uh, and then we are using it as a baseline for other organizations too, because we understood that IFRC has a huge experience in running such kind of programs. So it could be a baseline foundation for also other uh, organizations. So it's, if you could also elaborate on that, that would be great. And then I would ha also have some other follow-up that I can do it bilaterally with you. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Others in the room or online? Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Marga Ledo. I am a CASCAP uh, supporting the Ukrainian Red Cross Society. I don't have so many questions, but I have some contributions of uh, some aspects that are linked to data responsibility that had not been mentioned. Uh, I am working now in Ukraine, and one of the main issues there is uh, fraud, because the digital uh, enabling system allows people to to be rich. I mean, to be to, to be rich digitally with SMS, with on online uh, means. There are a lot of fraud, so we have a campaign with the National Bank of Ukraine to try to uh, address this issue. And I think as we are also co-chairs of the cash working group. We are liaising as a cash working group and uh, bringing this component that we sometimes don't uh, understand how sensitive it is because people are providing the data of their cards, the bank accounts, etc. And this is something that we need for our programs to deliver cash, but some people are taking some advantages. The other point is with uh, deduplication. Of course, this uh, digital ecosystem allows us to be more effective and to be more uh, targeted and to avoid duplication. But sometimes people are not aware they are being deduplicated. And sometimes when you are deduplicated, the time frame is not matching. I mean, we all know that we want to deliver in a timely manner and sometimes for whatever reasons, we got delayed. So this is creating a lot of problems. The third point is there are a lot of, uh, I mean, in, at the moment in that particular context, there is like the digital dream plus the normal people that are digital, di digitally ex excluded. So there are a lot of opportunities to register in many different ways. And this is creating a lot of expectations from people. Even the government has a platform where everybody that registers expects to be supported. And the government expects the humanitarian actors to deliver through that platform also. So there are a lot of expectations. And then the other, maybe the other element is uh, data protection is quite interesting because there everything is regulated. The law is, the, the legal framework is very important. So if you have any MOU with the government and you want to have access to a new level of data sets, you need to negotiate that. And normally it has to be regulated by the cabinet of ministry decree, which is quite efficient, considering that uh, the situation in the country, but also delays access to some information. 
And the other aspect is the conflict sensitive nature of uh, getting personal data in uh, the occupied or conflict affected areas. And how, for example, a quick example is we were trying to get data for ch about children in those areas. And because of all these uh, child trafficking uh, things that are happening, people were really, really afraid to reveal they have children or to share the children information. Because if that data reaches their own hands, those children may be also at risk. And maybe the last point is that we have, uh, as Ukrainian Red Cross, uh, with IFRC, we have some uh, MOUs with the government. One of them is with a highly sensitive uh, caseload. So instead of us collecting the data, we have an API integration with our cash platform. And then we go to the, of course, we need to verify and uh, do the, the monitor and the PDMs, etc. So we do that. I mean, we have uh, unique identifiers. And then we do the verification and monitoring from the government database. So we ask for authorization, we send our teams there, and then we do random lean sampling using their database and matching the unique identifiers. That's all. Really excellent intervention. And I can pick up on some of the threads you just shared to turn them into questions, because I think these issues are so acute, uh, of course, in Ukraine, where you're sharing the experience from, but also another response context. So thank you for that, Maria. Any other, yes, sorry, here. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Andres. I am a senior research manager at Give Directly. Quick question. How optimistic or not are you guys about the prospect of using non-traditional data for targeting, like cell phone-based data, um, given the risks in terms of data protection and, you know, all the things that we can think about? Curious your opinions on that. Thanks. Great. And yes, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine Titch, uh, working for CCD, Collaborative Cash Delivery Network and World Vision. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to just point on two points that Juliet and uh, Luisa have highlighted. Uh, we do see this push not only in Ukraine, everywhere, that we actually channel humanitarian cash transfers through existing or emerging social protection mechanisms. Now, Luisa, you have highlighted some of the moral dilemmas that are there, not only the technicalities. And I, I do think there is a very big lack of engagement around how do we see benevolent or not so much benevolent national state actors um, engaging on this that see that it's their right to have their citizens' data. And when humanitarian actors say, well, I may not want to share with you because of whatever concerns, this is a humanitarian neutrality impartiality issue. And uh, humanitarian data protection is just one component. So do we have any thought around maybe doing some research in that direction, which is, I think, the critical piece of the future to all panelists? Thank you. Thanks so much. Let's address that round of questions and interventions, and then we can do another round, because, again, we do have a bit of time here. So maybe to start with the first question, what are we actually talking about? That would have been a good thing to start the session with. When we talk about digital delivery or data management tools in the context of cash, and feel free to, yeah, starting with Louisa, but everyone can jump in here. No, I'm really because I'm I'm a, I'm not a technologist at all. I'm a very I'm a reluctant um, engager in these things. But the fundamentally, these digital mechanisms are tools, right? So we have to ask about what we're using them for. And when we're digitizing cash, and like Juliet was saying in the beginning, we tried to create these kind of one big systems. But first and foremost, and it's not specific to cash, but it is very critical to cash is around registration and eligibility. So how are we collecting personal information that then allows us to identify people um, to select the most vulnerable in most cases and then be able to deliver the cash assistance? Um, and again, that's not a cash specific issue, but cash magnifies and exposes all the other issues that we've been having in the humanitarian system. And it's used as kind of a vehicle to do that. Um, um, then there's the, the other, let's say the other big piece is around being able to deliver that cash to so financial services and working with financial service providers to be able to get that cash to them digitally. And um, that may or may not be connected to the registration. It's often a separate system. We saw in the Ukraine response that there were a lot of issues around what's the difference between collecting that registration data, being able to clean it, huge data sets, um, getting that to the financial service provider to be able to get the cash out. There's a lot of different things. And again, I'm the kind of person that would just say people, people, and then we figure out how that works. There's a lot of very smart people working on those issues, um, and many of them are in this room. The third one is around 
um, being able to communicate with people. So what Ian was referring to in terms of community engagement. So what are the digital tools that we're using for that communication um, so that people are you know, informed of entitlements, of selection, they can get in contact with those providing the assistance. And then I'm going to take a fourth group that the, all the, the digital people and the data people are going to just hold their, their heads in their hands is that it's all the kind of project management tools and, and, the, and the tools, the systems that agencies use to be able to digitize their operations. Um, and the reason I say that is because exactly your point that, that we don't have a consensus on what that looks like. So some big organizations are going to have um, a backend system, whether it's logistics or finance that connects to that. Others are going to have programmatic management tools that help them connect to their, you know, log frames and their monitoring and evaluation. It looks different in different operations and different you know organizations but by and large those are kind of the four i would say big buckets of how digital mechanisms are used in cash i probably missed something or actually in that big bucket there's probably 500 things but yeah I'd just like to add like specific examples like using digital tools so you have the databases that we store the information um you have um uh uh, the platforms that financial service providers use to enact those payments. Um, you have pieces of software, API, in between for the interoperability. And then, as Louisa suggested, um, organizations may have this connected to the back end, the finance, um, to monitoring and evaluation. Um, and then all of these sets of data or, or solutions can be either third party, so you can buy them from the market. Um, they can be proprietary, um, which some agencies have, you know, invested massive amounts of money to um, build up over the years um, and they can be just um, I think yeah proprietary or, or just uh, third parties are there any other sorts of there are open source sorry but there you go open source open source solutions yeah which bring their own benefits and complications but yes <laughs> maybe Ian, could you talk about Digit quickly? I know you had a separate conversation where you were able to go into that in more detail and then also pick up on the question on performance metrics, but also then I'd like Juliet to share maybe any additional thoughts at the broader level on how we actually monitor the effectiveness and or performance of different cash interventions. Sure. Uh, yeah, so the Digit, I mean, originally started as a project around digital ID and using digital ID in context where people don't have a an official ID or a formal ID, um, you know, it's can happen for a variety of reasons, right? Either people have never had one to begin with and weren't eligible, or people have lost or hidden or destroyed an ID for other purposes. Um, you know, so Digit was uh, looking at how could we uh, use, uh, I mean, this is one of the things we we're exploring with uh, like new technologies like blockchain, but how could we use a digital ID uh, to kind of maintain this continuity through the process so enable someone to register, but also give them an easy way that they could then use that. Um, in this case, like a QR code that's printed and they just put, are using the QR code in multiple places then to access services, you know, which included cash assistance. There was also some work around tying this into a health uh, health information and a health profile to access local uh, health services at community health facilities, um, but all tied back together again to the single registration and the, the QR code. I mean, there was an interesting aspect around the anonymity that was enabled with the use of the QR code and these kind of aspects. Um, uh, but it did sort of yeah, ultimately depend on this sort of interesting uh, interplay between like the digital and the physical uh, context. Um, there probably are other kinds of solutions. I mean, in terms of the digital platforms, I mean, there are also things that start to take us into kind of case management, you know, and providing different kinds of assistance. There are aspects to around the referrals and how we manage referrals. You know, this might be other kinds of platforms you know, that are also part of this digital ecosystem that's emerging. Um, on the performance side, uh, yeah, I mean, this could be a much bigger conversation. You know, I think there's a lot around the targeting and yes, we're trying to see that we're reaching the people that we're intending to reach. You know, so there's sort of the inclusion analysis, exclusion, looking at those aspects. I mean, we definitely do a lot of follow up to see, uh, like the household visits and focus group discussions to understand better too, like how people receive the assistance. I mean, was, was it easy to access? Did they run into any obstacles? Uh, how is the assistance used? I mean, are they finding, is it useful to them, right? I mean, ultimately, but we also wanted to know like what kind of needs, you know, is assistance being used to cover? So even when we're giving multi-purpose cash, trying to understand yeah, is the, the transfer value, right? You know, are people able to, to use it to access the things that they need the most? Um, so there is a lot of follow-up, I mean, that the Red Cross has been doing. I mean, I think we're trying to make this more consistent, more standard, certainly in larger programs, we have the resources for this. 
Um, we also do have the constraints too, though, of where, I mean, ultimately a lot of this is still dependent on humanitarian funding. You know, and I think, you know, unfortunately that's still constrained and limited in many contexts. So, for example, like these programs in, in Turkey with this uh, social safety nets program, you know, this was EU funded, you know, which is a fairly large amount, but there were at the same time too, there were, you know, one and a half million people receiving assistance over, you know, the last six or seven years, you know, at monthly intervals. And, you know, uh, the, the EU was interested to sort of start to see that assistance taper, you know, wanted people to graduate out, you know, and that question of like how you balance these programs, right, where you're, I mean, essentially trying to uh, understand what the donors' interests are, what possibilities you have with the constraints. You know, you want to focus the funding on who's the most vulnerable and understanding how that might be changing over a six or seven year period. You know, it's also kind of an interesting process. Um, but, it, but it is, yeah, interesting this question of like, are we, who are we targeting? Do we need to shift the targeting over time? How do we, how do we understand if those kind of changes are, are effective or not? But a lot around making sure that we're reaching the people, you know, that we do want to be reaching, that we're not missing people. You know, and I think that's also been a key part of our post distribution monitoring, for example, is not just to monitor the people that have received assistance, but who didn't receive assistance and like, what were the reasons for that? I mean, did they run into a problem completing the, the form? Was there some, some sort of translation or transcription issue? Uh, you know, were our eligibility criteria, you know, too stringent? You know, we're not, we're missing people that we shouldn't be missing. Um, so there, yeah, there is a lot of effort on that, but happy to talk more and uh, hand over to Juliet too for a wider perspective. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Ian. Julia? Sure. Um, I guess, and again, not from a practitioner perspective, but more from a coordination perspective. Again, I think it is it is interesting to see how that idea of how we're measuring impact, what are we actually looking to, to monitor, kind of shift. I think initially it was very procedural. Uh, how much money did you get? What time did you get it? Uh, was it there at the ATM? Was the ATM out of cash? Like, what happened? What bank did you use? And it also moved into very kind of programmatic considerations, but more from a kind of a smaller perspective of what did you spend it on? And there was a very heavy focus on this idea of did you spend it on the wrong things? This idea that everyone's going to spend it on cigarettes and alcohol if we give them cash. And I think that that was, again, a very, you know, kind of five to ten years ago kind of approach. I think the really fascinating thing is, is that, as Ian has kind of alluded to, is, is that we have had to become more creative in the way that we monitor. Uh, we can't just simply say, did you get a bag of rice? Did you get a piece of tarpaulin? We actually have to say what impact did it have? And I think, you know, if I was to say it's moved from a process to a program, I don't have a clever P, uh, a third P. Maybe it's protection. It may be something else. But I think more we talk about now more outcome level uh, monitoring. And I think cash has forced us to move away from activities, away from outputs, more towards that outcome piece. We see a lot more about, you know, negative coping strategies, protection considerations. Uh, Give Directly is here, I think, which is interesting. I think there was also some really interesting monitoring examples from Give Directly, which talked about how did people feel? Did they feel happy? Did they feel more relaxed? Did they feel less stressed? Which I always thought was a kind of fascinating thing, because in a way, what are we trying to achieve from a humanitarian intervention? I'd like you to feel secure. I'd like you to feel protected. I'd like you to feel safe. And that is ultimately what we're trying to achieve. And my final thing I will say is, is that I think Ian's final point is also really important. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning the genesis of a lot of the discussion around data was around this fear of duplication. It was inclusion error. Oh my gosh, are we going to give something twice? We are now moving more to say, how can we use these digital tools for exclusion? How can we say that those people who are truly, truly vulnerable may be left out of these kind of forms of assistance? I was just going to ask about exclusion errors, so that's great. So we have a, a few other questions from the floor, and then we will have time for another quick round. Just to, to maybe pick up on one of the things that really jumped out at me from Mariah's intervention on the conflict sensitivity piece and sort of what that looks like, either from the institutional program or service design perspective or from the kind of coordination cash working group perspective, how do you first understand sort of what the conflict dynamics and related sensitivities are in the context of cash in a given setting and are we equipped or maybe how equipped are we to navigate these issues in the context of cash ideally as they relate to data which you know Mariah's intervention framed well but also more broadly great i'll try to have a go at this one um I think um, there are many contexts where we operate where um, having data becomes a liability um, and it becomes, you know, an issue for us. Um, and once we're flagged as actors that actually have that data, that actually becomes, you know, a, a threat that might translate into um, a threat. 
in the context of cash working groups, um, what we try to do is again minimize the uh, the data that, that that can that must be shared, um, and then not go to the personally identifiable level if we don't need to. Um, and then you know having those data sharing protocols um, in place um, before we actually you know before there there is an onset disaster or before there is an uh, a conflict so you need those to be pre uh, pre positioned because signing a data sharing agreement takes months on end sometimes um, so it's about preparing for 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 these um, eventualities and again I, I go back to minimization of what we share um, and then again just destroying it um, uh, after it's no longer um, being used. I hope that kind of answers the question. Thanks, Rami. Just checking. Anyone else want to come in on this one? Yeah, Louisa. I mean, I think the, there's there's a couple of things to unpack. One is on around conflict sensitivity in terms of what it means and who we access and who we can interact with. Um, and I think in the in the case of Ukraine, this was really poignant in terms of asking people to essentially self-register and asking a lot of information that was essentially then very difficult for certain people in parts of the country or certain groups of people to be able to do. Um, there I would say sometimes the best way is to go old school and to go analog and to and, and to figure out, you know, complementary ways. But Marga's point was, was also important is that the more ways in which there are to register for cash, the more confusing it can become. Um, and so I think one of the things is that in the in the cash space we've kind of abused a bit the 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 humanitarian imperative to respond, in the sense that it's really hard to distinguish between when you need to have multiple systems and then manage the risk around that versus we have multiple systems just because we thought we didn't have time to do anything else. And I think that that for me is a really important issue when we talk about the conflict sensitivity of of cash because we might be overlooking certain things. And then the second thing is around the actual delivery of cash. Um, there have been some really interesting discussions that I don't think we've had in, out in the open, and maybe that's something to be researched going forward and, and going back to, to Catherine's point on, um, on the kind of sensitivities and, and, and unpacking that, is that who owns those companies, right? Um, there's, and, and without talking with local, um, let's say local organizations that are responding in different ways, whether they're, they're more development or humanitarian, and talking to communities themselves and looking at how they access different financial services, um, we can't really understand that because we've walked into situations where, um, you know, on, on paper, because we have all these requirements from, from donors and I, I think, you know, not, not to, let's say, put the blame on donors. We all have, let's say, accountability to, to make sure that we've got good programs in place. But, you know, we have to have very transparent procurement. And so the biggest and the best may be the one that's winning the bid, and maybe it's owned by someone who is part of the conflict. I mean, we've had this come up. Um, and so for me, those are the two conflict-sensitive issues. Is one around the access and how do you reach communities, and is everyone getting the same ability to reach that assistance and to connect with people? And then the other one is around, do we really understand the, 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 the politics uh, around the systems we're engaging in? I mean, you hit on a, a really difficult issue to address because it's a balancing of consequences in terms of, to Catherine's question, the principles. And we have to, of course, maintain neutrality, independence, and impartiality, mm -hmm. but also humanity, the, the core driving principle to assist those most vulnerable in need as best and quickly as possible. And the, the issues you flag, I think, are a nice segue to anyone else who wants to come in on this sort of issue of humanitarian space and maintaining a, a principled approach to cash assistance. There's the ownership of a financial service provider or entity. There's also the platform issue, which is a broader discussion now around the use of these tools and services in different environments sheer use of a tool that is owned by a company from a certain country in a particular context could cause an affiliation or reputational risk that might cut off your access to delivering assistance. And so these are, it's still nebulous how institutions should think about that consistently across contexts, but it's an, it's an issue we need to be considering. And then finally, as Catherine framed it, there are questions around engagement with local actors, different types of local actors, different authorities in different settings, and that's often a national and subnational issue. The complexity is deep. So how do we think about navigating that or, or what's the shape of the problem? Maybe Julia first, yeah. 
Um, I just have one reaction to, to Catherine's point, which is this idea of humanitarian neutrality and impartiality, and particularly the, 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 the use of cash in some of these emergencies. One thing I am struggling with, and maybe somebody else has a clear answer to this, is, is that I think we're very clear on the differentiation or the delene delineation when it comes to financial flows. If a ministry asks me that they want to be the ones who receive the money and, and kind of push it out, I say, no, I'm so sorry, that's against humanitarian principles. I could not possibly allow that to happen. Everything else is a little bit less clear. And I think that we have to be very careful and very self-reflective in terms of where, therefore, do we see that humanitarian imp impartiality and neutrality principles. We're very clear when it comes to our money. We're not so clear when it comes to our programs and our data. Thanks, Julia. Rami, you also wanted to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to comment um, on uh, Catherine's um, question on benevolent actors and benevolent actors can come in the form of um, the suppliers themselves that we use. Um, they come in the form of potential new partners that pop up after a conflict. Um, they, they can come, come in a variety of ways and, and shapes. Um, there are processes to vet. There's OFAC lists, there's, um, you know, sanctions lists and in, in, in some countries. Um, however, when it comes down to that um, local level, I think it, it is one of the areas that remains challenging for the humanitarian community to, to look at it, because um, if you want to go down to the supplier level or even to the recipient level, um, I think this is where digital can may, uh, may be able uh, to, to maybe leverage, sorry, um, um, to perhaps push this agenda. Um, but it is a pertinent question, I think, and um, I, I think that it hasn't been, you know, addressed um, uh, as much as, as we would like to, to, to be addressed. Yeah, Ian, thanks for having me. I think we're also seeing some really interesting questions too between like uh, the, the ability with digital solutions to offer like assistance remotely. And then this idea of like how we also have like, other mediated ways of providing assistance. And like on the, the Red Cross request side, I mean, this is, there's a lot of questions coming up with like some of the systems we have for like self-registration is that obsoleting the local presence we have and the, the volunteer network. That's a huge strength of how we operate and like how do we see these operating in parallel and complementing each other? Um, yes, yeah, so I think we definitely talk about like, you know, the, maybe it's a sequencing piece where people might register digitally, but then there's additional kinds of follow up that might be in person. And how do we see that sequencing maybe changing in the future? Um, but there are definitely points that come up too around intermediation and you know, issues around bias and protection um, risks that come up that having people be able to apply remotely for some sort of assistance that happens directly, you know, where there's not some sort of discretionary assessment of eligibility or even a verification, you know, that that removes opportunities for bias, right? And like the, if somebody's going in and somebody else is deciding whether they're eligible or not, right? Or even with the provision of identification, you know, if you have an identification piece that doesn't match exactly, but that whether there's discretion to accept it or not. I mean, this does introduce context where bias starts to happen and where protection issues start to emerge. So it's interesting to see too, where some of the digital solutions and the remote uh, as, uh, assistance, you know, provide these opportunities to, to avoid it, but it's going to be context specific, right? I mean, how do you balance uh, these things? Well, and as if by design, that's also a good segue to the last question in the first round around new data sources and whether there is any you know example or concrete uh, thing we can point to in terms of how CDRs was the the data mentioned, but other forms of data that are maybe non traditional in humanitarian settings might be used to inform targeting needs assessment. I don't know from from anyone on the panel's experience whether that's something you're seeing more of. I'm going to let Rami comment on the on the mobile phone data and surveillance. Um, I do think that there's been there's been so much focus on targeting and reaching the right people and ensuring that that as humanitarian aid providers there's an understanding of who we are trying to serve. But it also comes a little bit too much, almost too obsessive, where there's this whole focus, you were talking about Turkey, for example, this whole focus on having the most perfect targeting system and using all this data in different ways. And I found that the, the academic world does a really good job of doing a deep dive into that many years later and saying, actually, and there's a really interesting study in Lebanon, for example, saying, actually, the best proxy was administrative data. So you register your kid for school. Um, and there's certain data points that are collected and that you give willingly as a, as, as let's say, part of your interaction as a citizen or uh, as a refugee, or whatever the case may be. And that was actually more 
reliable after doing all these kind of econometric analyses than going into a proxy means test where you're collecting all this different type of data. So sometimes I wonder if maybe the alternative data is going back to basics. Um, but I do, the, the, the thing that does make me a little bit concerned and, and going back to your point on data minimization is what are we using it for? And when, when did the person or the, or the group of people, um, cons what did they consent to use that information for? Or that, and, and I think that's where I get a little bit, again, I'm probably old school and, and too conservative on that, and I never thought I would describe myself as conservative on anything, but that is something that makes me a little bit uncomfortable because we have a responsibility as, let's say, aid providers, and I take the aid providers meaning whether you're a government entity providing social assistance or a humanitarian organization on the ground serving your community, we have a responsibility to inform people. And one of the things we're seeing is that if we don't understand it, um, then it's really difficult to communicate it back to people. So back to Ian's point about this, simplifying the targeting actually makes the program more accountable. And from, uh, let's say, a, um, a digital perspective, then you're looking for tools that enable you to make that more transparent, more, you know, the ease of, ease of use, but also more accountable, whether it's to the people you're serving or donors. Um, and so I do think that that's something that, for me at least, it's a, it's a bit of a gray area, but maybe you want to weigh in on your surveillance capitalism. Um, kind of worms, no? Um, so I'm just going to give an example of a, um, not a specific context, but let's say it's an imaginary context where we've given out cash cards um, to um, people in response to uh, a crisis. And they've used these cash cards to pull out um, cash from specific ATMs. Now, our fraud, anti fraud, well, not fraud team, anti fraud um, team may have looked into the spending patterns. Um, they have looked at the times that the specific cards were accessed at the specific ATMs, and they've, you know, recognized some patterns. Um, we see those 50 same cards on that specific ATM at 12 at night, every time after the distribution happens. Now that information becomes interesting, and you might want to, you know, dig deep into it. But here, here's the moral dilemma. Like when you find something um, out of this analysis, um, what do you do with that? With those findings? Obviously, if there's fraud on, on a, as a humanitarian sort of um, actor, you may stop this assistance. But what if it uncovers other things that the humanitarian community is not in charge of policing? And what if the authorities start going after this information and asking about it? Um, here you run into these moral issues of how do we deal with this? And, you know, we're authorized to use the data. Um, we have consent for a specific purpose. Um, then how do we also, you know, compare that with legislation? Um, we also want to be, you know, compliant with um, the laws in the countries that we're operating. So those are questions that, um, you know, we, we continue to think about over. Yeah, and that, sorry, go ahead, Ian. Yeah, can I make a quick comment just on the, we see, we had similar examples too, I think come up with a card program where, yeah, it's sort of the pattern shows that it's one person using multiple cards, you know, and uh, in Turkey, this question came up too, and like the question of like, how do you research and understand like what the, what is this, what does it indicate? Is it like a fraud or protection issue or is it actually like a positive coping mechanism, right? Where someone's being, you know, doing this on behalf of other sets of people. And it is an interesting point, right? Because you can see the pattern, but you don't necessarily know exactly what it means. And yeah, you know, that question of like, how do we do this sort of, this research to, to dig into it more uh, definitely comes up. Thanks. It's a good reminder as just one specific example of the balance between digitalization and analog, the persistence of the analog, the persistence of the human in the loop processes, which are critical to address all the issues you've, you've spoken to throughout the session. I think also just to, to quickly touch on some of the data responsibility concepts that are bubbling around, there are issues of which legislation or frameworks we are subject to as humanitarians. This constantly rears its head in discussions on cash, but other forms of assistance, because in any given context, in any given sort of subnational location, you'll have likely a UN entity, an international NGO, national organizations, including civil society and government delivering assistance and the degree to which different frameworks apply to their data management varies widely. We haven't cracked this 
and it's likely to get more complex, but one way of approaching this is to come together, define common sensitivity classifications, define common terms for data sharing using instruments that the panelists have mentioned, and then ideally something we'd like to see more of, and if you've seen an example, please let us know, but really starting from a common assessment of risk and a common expectation of benefit from data before it's collected. That will help with data minimization. That will help also keep track and maybe even have some additional metrics for monitoring whether we are upholding the rights of the people we're serving while delivering them the best assistance we can, and also create more space for maintaining humanitarian space. We have to be able to say that we are up to, if not above, the gold standard for how we manage data responsibly. If we aren't at that level, it's hard for us to engage in a productive conversation with national counterparts and others on how to get this right. So I see, I think resources, yes, great. Resources in the chat, which means no more questions. Quickly, any other questions from the floor? And then we'll go into the final short comments from the panelists. Hi, I'm Carla Lacerda. I'm with WFP. Um, I think it's interesting. I'm just picking up, and I agree with a lot of the discussion points that, that have been made. I think it's really interesting that the minute we hear the word data, we think digital. And it really means that we are in this obsessive kind of, you know, the 21st century where absolutely everything we talk about, the minute we think data, we think digital. And it's interesting because I, I think back to my first cash program in the Philippines, for example, where we did cash for work. There was no digital stuff. We were trying to obviously implement kind of delivering cash assistance through mobile phones, for example, but we still had an analog list of the participants of cash for work assistant and we collected their names their last names we also collected their signatures and we collected sometimes fingerprints or sometimes just an evidence that donors so that donors could see that we were delivering it to people and not just giving it to our employees or, or delivering so i think one point i wanted to make to make is data does not include digital Right, absolutely, and I think that's a really important point. There are a lot of countries in Asia right now where we try to do a lot of UNCCS data interoperability, which is absolutely impossible from a digital point of view. It has to be very much analog and even links with social protection. It's very challenging to do in contexts like Niger. Um, I think what we're trying, the second point I wanted to make is, I think what we're trying to say is let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Um, we're not trying to say that data or digitization and collecting data is a bad thing. We need to collect data to deliver assistance, particularly cash assistance. So I think it's about balancing how much data do we collect to make sure that we're assisting the right people, to make sure that we're avoiding fraud and countering a diversion um, of humanitarian operations while also safeguarding people's privacy and people's data. So I think that's, you know, I think it doesn't have to be a um, one or the other. Um, which I feel sometimes when we have these discussions, we do very, get very passionately either against collecting data or for collecting data. Um, I do think that for interagency coordination um, to avoid overlaps and to be more efficient, we absolutely need to collect data. And there is an issue about how do we <clears throat> ensure that consent that's given to one agency um, is also um, okay for people to, to share that data with other agencies. So those are just like just three quick points I wanted to flag. Um, I do think that the point that Margo mentioned and that came up about conflict sensitivity is really important when we're working with governments that are party to the conflict. But there is also a really exciting point, which is the opportunities of system enhancement, of government system enhancement. So working together, for example, the way that WFP is working in Ukraine to enhance the data systems of the government and really using the opportunity of the war and not letting a good crisis go to waste and actually uh, ensuring that humanitarians can leave something better behind. So I think that's something that, that's really important. Um, two quick questions I had um, is that there was no mention of biometrics. We kind of didn't really touch on that. I don't know if that was on purpose. <laughs> But, um, I mean, there are two huge cases, right, that came out in Yemen and in Myanmar in recent years um, that really talk about sort of how, how biometrics is a challenge and, and how, we use, how we use it for cash assistance or humanitarian assistance. And then, you know, blockchain technologies, et cetera. Um, and the second question is, I wonder if the colleagues in the room had any opinions about how the GDPR policy, not that I'm a technologist either, 
uh, but how the new policies in Europe have affected the ways that we work and consider doing better um, data responsibility and digitization and delivery of cash assistance over. Thank you, Carla. I thought I saw another hand. Yeah, and then Paul. So yeah, you, sir, and then over here. Hi, this is Aftal from Plan International. I have two questions um, from the practically from the field. Um, I'm also concerned about this data responsibility. Let me take the example of Tigray in Ethiopia, which is just recently opened with access. Um, we collect data, data, and also UN agencies collected data as, as well. And um, how or do we ascertain that the data is not shared with the government, where the government is on, on one side of the conflict to respect the humanitarian principles? That is one thing. Second, if you come to the digital platform or blockchain, um, and the blockchain technology means what I've explored so far is that the data is in a cryptic value. How is it audit compliant, especially with the donors when they audit the uh, on different interventions? Let me give an example, like um, we as an organization had interventions in different countries. Let me take the example of Egypt. We did cash transfers in 2016-17. It was audited by a very known humanitarian donor. And there was no proof on the side of recipient to prove, show the proof that I have received the money. But there was a proof on the platform which transferred the cash. The result was that amount of money was disallowed to the tunes of some millions. So these are two questions. How is it audit compliant? And first is how do we respect the humanitarian principles? Thank you. Thank you very much. We will pick it up over lunch then. So in place of my planned final round of a you know quick thing each of your stakeholder groups can do to move forward on these issues, we've got the additional questions from the floor. So everything from well, we weren't avoiding biometrics on purpose, but it often sucks the air out of the room. So no is the answer to that question, but sure, people can come in on biometrics or the questions around blockchain and compliance, questions around data sharing with authorities in sensitive contexts, questions around the uh, issues raised or perhaps improvements driven by GDPR and other similar frameworks or any other final thoughts uh, people might have starting Sure, Rami, then we'll go from there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we did not forget about biometrics, Carla. Um, but I think, and this is something that the uh, Collaborative uh, Cash Delivery Network has touches on in some of our pieces of work, which is being technology ag agnostic is okay. Like it all depends on the context. We don't need to be using biometrics everywhere. We don't need to be um, using all these digital tools in contexts where there's no need or they don't fit or they don't work. Um, we don't have to design these overly complicated um, programs that would need a, you know, a steep learning curve to implement in different places. Um, that's not how it works. Our work is very varied across contexts and in each context we, we need to, you know, um, to Ian's um, uh, comments previously, um, sometimes the best system is just a simple system that enables us to deliver um, aid um, in, a, in a dignified way and in a safe way to the recipients. We don't need to get bogged down with all of these details and too much tech. Um, so where we need to use biometrics, we may be able to employ them, um, but where there's no need there, or there's no capacity or it's too expensive or it doesn't make sense, um, why use biometrics? Um, so, a little bit conservative on that one, just like Louisa. <laughs> yes. How about Ian, Louisa, then Julia? Uh, sure. Maybe I'll make a comment on the biometrics. So, so I think <clears throat> from the IFRC side, like at the moment, I guess we're trying to avoid biometrics in terms of like deduplication, like in the broad levels, but we're using it in some cases to help with the verification. Um, I think the idea of, yeah, we're trying to not hold on to biometric data <laughs> or hold it as little as we can, right? And to try and break down a little bit what the, what the verification needs are and can we address parts of them? Like does biometrics help us do that a little bit? Or, and, but can we do, uh, avoid doing that without storing the biometric data in a more significant way? Um, the other piece I was curious to come back on was the con consent and this idea of the referrals and multi-agency. I do think that's something we should, 
we need uh, some stronger solutions collectively because I think like you know we definitely need to get the language right if we want to try and promote this and that we're having some common phrasings that we're explaining it well to people that would they understand them what the option is and what the uh, the benefits are but I think if we try and do that individually in our organizations we're going to end up with different wordings more confusion you know I think that question of like do people do people really consent to have their information shared you know I think when when lawyer sorry when lawyers look at it they would say uh, no probably in most cases right unless it was really solid that this is something we're using consistently you know we have a strong track record where they were explaining it well and that the intent was clear um so thanks I'll answer a couple of questions at once and talk a little bit about again data for whom and what purpose and I think it touches on kind of this idea of the referral so I will give a little shout out to the protection colleagues and some of them are in the room they've done a lot of work on kind of informed consent around referrals and the language that's needed there so we don't really need to reinvent the wheel um, particularly when it comes to cash but I will say that when it comes to referrals, when it comes to biometrics and, and this, the, some of these other issues, we, we often tend to look at it from a provider perspective. So, you know, after I give this example of, of disallowed costs because the level of verification was not up to the standard. Well, whose level of verification? The donors. And so I think that there needs to be conversations prior, as you were saying, Stuart, to, to be able to talk about what is a good enough verification that is also comfortable for the people we're trying to serve. I have yet, and if you have an example, please come up and tell me later, but I have yet to see an example of biometrics that where, where there's fully informed consent by the community and you don't have that power imbalance of basically, I need to give you biometrics in order to receive assistance. We, don't, we have not seen an example like that. And similarly, I think with blockchain, interestingly, the big issue we're running into is when it is applied, it's, it's putting a lot of strain on, on localization efforts, just in terms of being able to manage those systems and, and to be able to engage with them in a, in a meaningful way. And my last point would just be that the focus on, on kind of what we call either frontline or first responders, those who are engaging with communities on a regular basis, when we're talking about data um, and, and, and data responsibility, they need to be much more implicated because they're the ones that are going to be explaining um, informed consent and getting that and, and working around that. Um, and then the last, last, last point is the probably the most important thing uh, for data responsibility on some of these issues is the unsexiest, which is data disposal. Um, and, and getting rid of that. And I think it goes back to that verification point because a lot of times you have to keep it. Um, and so we need to have a conversation early on and, 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 and figure out what makes the most sense for, for the communities we're working with. Um, yeah, I'm going to say on the questions what they said. Um, and instead, I'm just going to say, I think my reflection or my takeaway to go back to my original tasking was also just that Carla asked, what is the right amount of data? I don't think we have that question now, but I can say with some certainty that we are very good at making things complex. Um, and if we want to have these conversations, we have to be better at coordinating not only among ourselves, but within others. Again, I know it sounds like a broken record, but for me, the idea of data minimization hinges on that. If we're going to collect less data, we need to know what's important, what is not, and how we are going to share that among each other. Um, so that would be my takeaway. Great. In uh, his most recent book, Hugo Slim points specifically to cash and social protection programs as an example of how complex and adorned the humanitarian system has gotten, and he calls for a simpler, better system, and this might be a really good place for us to start. Thank you all for joining us online and in the room. Juliet, Rami, Louisa, and Ian, thank you so much for your time and insight. This is obviously a con an ongoing conversation. So we will continue it in our various networks and groups this week at lunch, over coffee, et cetera. And again, you know, really appreciate the opportunity to connect and share this experience with everybody, but you know, we want to hear from you. So come find the panelists, not so much me. I have the least expertise in this area, but happy to hear examples and also areas where you'd like us to help bring people together to dive into data responsibility and cash moving forward. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of the week.